Welcome back to The Short Game. This is the show where we talk about short video games, the kind of things you can pick up and complete in an evening or a weekend, games that respect your time. I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and I am joined once again this week by my full complement of co-hosts. I've got, to my left, Laura Nash. How are you doing, Laura? I'm terrific. Awesome. And I am joined once again by Nate Heininger. How are you, Nate? I'm doing well. Uh, currently traversing through Downwell, so uh, don't ask me too many questions. All right. Try to focus on the show while playing your, your video game on your phone, Nate. And uh, and I am joined, of course, also by my bro host, Shane Kelly. How are you doing, Shane? Oh, I'm feeling good. I'm really excited to get back to this topic. Uh, the week before last, we spent a whole episode talking about some of the games for IF Comp 2015. And if you didn't listen to that episode, um, it's not really required listening for this episode. We're going to be talking about a different set of games. But just to recap briefly, IF Comp is the interactive fiction competition. It's a yearly event, and it's uh, one of the biggest events in the interactive fiction scene. This year, 55 games were entered um, by nearly 55 authors. There's actually a couple of duplications, folks who submitted more than one game. And um, last week, we, or the week before last, we talked about quite a few of them. How many? I think maybe eight or nine or something like that. Maybe eight. But this week, we're going to talk about another batch. Uh, there's no way we're ever going to be able to talk about all 55 games, but uh, we're going to briefly touch on some of them and talk about what we thought was interesting. And um, if the IF Comp is something that is interesting to you, you can go to www.ifcomp.com. Net? Hang on. Org. 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 <laughs> org. I have to keep throwing in internet <laughs> suffixes and you'll find it eventually. Dot limousine. You can do whatever you want now. Dot diamonds. And uh, you'll find the full list of games there. Every one of the games that we're talking about is available for free on the page. And if you play at least five of them, you can participate in the voting and uh, and vote on each game on a one to ten scale. Um, so who wants to start? I can start. Awesome. I had... Uh... I had an interesting game this week. Um, I unfortunately didn't have all that much time, so I kind of picked one of the games off the list uh, somewhat at random, and I wound up with Untold Riches, which is by Jason Ermer. And it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting game, but not all not entirely because of the play. So just to give you this the the basics. Untold Riches is a very traditional um, piece of interactive fiction, kind of puzzle-based, um, very short. Uh, I managed to play through it in about half an hour. And what you get when you open it up is it's basically uh, you wash up on a, on a beach on an island and it's you're kind of the, uh, the plucky sidekick to kind of the bumbling doctor uh, and you're literally following a treasure map and, and solving puzzles. Um, it's a pretty charming game, it, but it's very much uh, exactly what you expect when it comes to interactive fiction. The puzzles, I will say, are very straightforward and easy. I did not get stuck one time. Um, I kind of was nice. It kind of felt like a little warm up uh, for some of our other games compared to some of the more experimental stuff. As a kind of a more experienced player of interactive fiction, I did not find it challenging, uh, but that's not a mark against it. It had really good puzzle design. Things were very clear without having to be telegraphed for you. It had some moments where I realized th there was some good situational writing. So like if you uh, you, you, you have a, an item like a whistle and you get different sound des descriptions of the sound depending on the kind of room that you're in. Uh, so it's it's well coded. And I think the 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 fact that it's really solidly written in terms of coding is the thing that's interesting about the game because this game is the stated purpose of the game um, from the the author is not to make the world's best um, piece of interactive fiction. He's written it as a teaching model for middle school students. Oh. So the code is available. You can open up the code and look through it. And I think for that reason, it's pretty interesting. Um, it's small enough that you can play it in the first half of an hour and then spend the second half of the hour pouring through the code itself and 
like seeing how the game works because it's written to be a model. I think the the code itself is gonna is is written in a way where it's a little bit more clear, like what's going on. You can actually read through it and and get an understanding of how these kinds of things are programmed. So. I definitely recommend that as an experience. The game it's itself, really not a, not an awesome experience. Well, a, a very competent, but nothing shocking or original. Uh, exploring the code, um, I did just sort of take a quick skim, and it let me know. It taught me a few things about how IF works, which I thought was pretty cool. That is really neat. Um, something I think was really cool that I wasn't really familiar with until this year with IF Comp was that um have you guys seen playfic the website no no i don't believe so it's a, a website by andy bayo who has done a bunch of other important web stuff including he's the guy behind upcoming.org and uh xoxo like he's one of the organizers of that anyway he, he's a neat guy follow him on twitter but um he and a friend or someone i don't know who the other person was made this website playfic which is a uh a entirely web-based tool for uh, programming and playing Inform 7 games. And um, they kind of designed it to make, you know, creating interactive fiction like these games more accessible. It's uh, it's based on Inform 7, and it uses something called Parchment, which is another. Uh, if you notice on all of the um, Inform based or, or like inter- you know parser based games on the uh, IF comp this year all of them have a play online link and in the past when I I always avoided those types of things because in the past all these play online type of um, uh, options for parser based interactive fiction were a huge pain in the ass they were either like java based or otherwise kind of janky looking um, parchment which is actually a separate project but related with playfic there it uses it makes playing these games online really simple and easy. And it does a couple of things that are really smart. It has beautiful fonts. So it's like really attractive to play. And in fact, it's it's better looking on there than on any uh, locally installed parser, you know, player that I've used. And secondly, um, if you want to save, rather than having you deal with save files, it just creates a unique URL for you, which you can bookmark. And then when you go to that bookmark, your game picks up where you left off, which I thought was really oh, smart. That's pretty nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hadn't experienced that until this year because I'd always kind of avoided online based um, parser tools for playing interactive fiction because they were all, always so janky in the past, but totally solid. And then if you want to try programming interactive fiction, it looks like, I don't really know anything about it personally from that side, but it looks like that's gotten really easy now too. Sidebar. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's actually that's actually really cool. I definitely think that, you know, the, that it's going to be really neat to see what kind of the modern web tools do with this classic genre and have been doing i mean look at twine and one that we definitely saw was the tool called what was it called again aspel was on it seltani Mm -hmm. was the yeah it was like the mist inspired linked um i would call it a mud multi-user dungeon but that would be my uh that would be me me being really old but yeah like multiplayer interactive text-based games uh it's a really cool idea to kind of bring these newer technologies together with these older genres. I, I think uh, even more so than that, though, I think something like Playfic is just a natural fit, especially since it's using Inform 7, which is basically the standard language for these things now. So working our way up the list, since you just talked about what is alphabetically the last game for IF Comp 2015, I'm just going to... Yeah, why do you think I chose it? Yeah, I'm just going to work <laughs> up the list from the opposite direction. And uh, I played the second to last, which was called Unbeknown. Um, Now, I played four games uh, this week, and this was the longest one. And I'm I'm afraid to say it's not my favorite of the four or, or, you know, of however many I've played so far for the this year. Uh, Emily Short recommended this one when we were corresponding over email, basically sight unseen. She hadn't played it yet, um, but it's by Alan De Niro, who's apparently written some really great stuff in the past. She recommended his previous game, Solarium, which apparently was a parser-based thing. This is actually a Twine uh, story. And I don't want to spoil anything because it is a really interesting game. Just to kind of set it up, you start out in a situation where you're you're kind of running away from... Um, people described as Z mules, which is a very weird, evocative sort of, um, you know, uh, 80s 
uh, sci-fi post-apocalyptic sounding kind of thing. And, and the Z mules are, are chasing you across the landscape and you're trying to get away from them. And then very quickly, it becomes apparent that you're actually playing an online game. It, it's, uh, you know, the first thing that I noticed was, all right, one of your captors named 420 Planet says, stay safe. <laughs> so, you know, it, it starts naming the characters and they all have these these names that sound like something out of like Daisy or something like that. And um, it eventually actually gives you an option to log off. And you leave the game, but the world that you leave into seems like more game. And I'll kind of leave it there. Um, I did play this one all the way to completion. It's not very long. It's a pretty interesting little story. The writing of it didn't quite work for me. Um, that's not to say it wasn't super competent or anything. I think it's probably just that when I... Um, uh, approach Twine these days, I kind of have this weird set of expectations set by things like Porpentine, where I'm like looking for layers of meaning and, and looking for really inventive prose and, um, I don't know, looking for things with weird punctuation. This is just a very straight, competent story told through Twine, and it's it's got a fairly interesting ending. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it completely did it for me, but it's not anything I can really clearly put my finger on. So I know, you know, this this is all about kind of rating things. We haven't really been talking about how we've been rating games personally. I would give this game maybe like a solid seven. And I think it's a really solid game. And I think that if, uh, if the setup intrigues you, you should definitely play it. It wasn't my favorite out of the ones that we've talked about so far, though. I do want to check out this guy's other work, though. Yeah, there's a lot worse scores you can get than a... Uh... Yeah, actually, I almost feel bad because we haven't <laughs> talked about any scores yet, and maybe I kind of want to leave those out of our, our discussion here. So Yeah, um, I didn't give a score to any of my games, and if yeah. I had, it would have been I've done harder. rating, but I don't want to give them I'm out. mentally scoring everything. I, I just kind of felt like I wanted to say, like, this game is a good, solid game that just didn't completely win me over for a reason that I can't fully express. I've never heard you be unable to express feelings on a video game, Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, moving up. Wait, was that like a compliment or a dig? I can't tell. I think it was both. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and turn over the floor to the next up our list, going in the same order. Uh, Laura, you played the Baker of Shireton? I sure did. And this game is um, not what it seems on the tin. The Baker of Shireton looks like a game where you are playing a baker, an NPC, and an MMO. And you are baking things, and people come, and you can sing a song, give them a quest, and bake bread. You know, there's a um, homeless man who keeps begging, which is really annoying because he keeps stealing from your customers and driving them away. Um, so you play a couple times, and then, you know, a raider comes and kills you, which is not cool. And you can, and then you get a score, and it's like you earned a total of 46 points out of like, you know, Nine 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 nine. You're like, how the hell do you get a score like that? You play again, um, and you come to realize that there's a lot more game there. Um, there's a walkthrough that that is provided, and the first page is basically like, oh, did you know that you can, you know, do a there's, the game requires you to die. And I was like, you can die in this game other than getting <laughs> killed by the raider. There's milestones. Um, burned by the ovens in the bakery? I think this game is going to be incredibly divisive because if you bother reading the walkthrough or if you stumble upon the alternate gameplay scenarios and you get out of your NPC hellhole of the bakery, it's actually, hellhole is really strong. It's really nice baking bread in the bakery until, you know, a guy dies. The really fun thing is you're <laughs> selling bakery. It's always nice in the bakery until a guy until dies. Until you get killed by somebody. <laughs> Warm, um, good smells. If you're in World of Warcraft near the baker, you're probably going to get stabbed by a rando. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's what the game was about. But no, apparently it, you can actually see the chat of players and it's a different typeface. Um, it's oh. a parser based game. Um, and then you see like, you know, Megan627 has entered and they're having a conversation about selling potions or something. And you're still trying to sell your your goddamn bread you worked so hard to bake. Um, you... The help file also helps a lot in this because I typed in help and it was like, the all command is helpful. So I accidentally one time just typed all. They're like, oh, there's a back room, which is an endless storehouse. It's like, oh, okay. 
I played through twice. <laughs> then I opened up the walkthrough, read the first page, quit it, and tried to go on my own. And the game is so much more once you do that. That's really intriguing. Yeah. And once I knew the first step of, you know, how to get out of the bakery, basically, then I had a lot of fun of... Um, this is a very minor spoiler, but you can burn your bakery down you know, stuff in the <laughs> oven for too long. And I didn't know you were supposed to do that. You're supposed to burn your bakery down. <laughs> like all good bakers ultimately like, do. Why would you do that? But because it's based in MMO world, you're supposed to, you know, it's basically that you get a milestone and it'll save your progress. And then when you respawn, you still have access to some of the materials you've learned in the last, you know, the spells or whatever you've learned the last bit. So I got pretty far in this game. It's definitely on the hard side, and I think I, I feel a little bit like I spoiled it, but I think I probably helped a lot of people because I'm not prone to reading hint files if I wasn't recording for the podcast. Um, I didn't know this game was as rich as it was, and I think it's going to get scores all over the map for that reason because it's hmm. a baking simulator. It fails. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're just baking bread and singing songs, Let's and it's be not honest. that interesting. It's, it's really hard to make a good baking simulator. Well, I haven't had, you haven't played Cook Serve Delicious. What a what a disappointment. Yeah, it lasts like 40 turns, and you make some sourdough, and you get some coins, and a hobo annoys you, and then you get stabbed. <laughs> That's not a fulfilling experience. normal experience. baker's life. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. I, I wonder it's re- I wonder if that's going to be a big contender for the golden banana of Discord. Like I I feel like it would because if you find out there's more to the game, it's really fun. Mm-hmm. Um and it's a really random and it's hard puzzles. Um and if you didn't look that up, you're going to think it's a really simple the game. Play crappy baking simulator. And you awesome. played a baking simulator. It, it's a fun enough baking simulator, but there's not enough there there. I was starting to say, Reagan, that Jamie would really like this game, but now I'm thinking she wouldn't because she only likes cooking games. Well, she'd probably just do the baking part again and again. Well, yeah. a lot of it's making dough, making dough, making dough, making dough, you know, <laughs> baking bread, baking bread, putting it in the display case, making, <laughs> making sure you give people the right types of loaves. And um, you can murder the hobo. Just saying, I figured out how to murder the hobo, and I was very proud of myself. Awesome! Like, oh, congratulations! We're very, very. You also proud have of you, to Laura. murder the hobo to move forward. You have to figure out how to murder the hobo. That's not the first time you've said that. What an excellent puzzle! <laughs> <laughs> well, from that, uh, from that seemingly cheerful and uh, and endearing tale of hobo murder, we move on to what was maybe the most distressing game. I've played for this year's IF comp certainly, and and in any IF for a while, and that was uh, Togherm, or Harm. Yeah, it, it looks like with an M. Yeah, Togherm by Chandler. Togherm. Scottish, Irish, I, Welsh. I, it, I am not really sure. That almost sounds like Norwegian. Yeah, it is weird. Um, so Chandler Groover, you've heard his name on this podcast a couple of times before. Last week we talked about his game Midnight Period Sword Fight Period. Um, which Shane uh, gave a pretty glowing endorsement and uh, yep. also talked about his previous game, uh, Grover's Nose, on our episode when we talked Not about... Grover's Nose. that He's Grover. It was Toby's Nose. Oh, dang it. Sorry, you're right. Grover. <laughs> Chandler's Grover. Nose. Chandler Grover's Nose. No, yeah, Toby's Tag Nose. Tagharm's Nose. Ugh, well, so from his game about dogs, perhaps he perhaps he decided he really hated cats because, well, first, to set up the game, the description on the IF Comp page, which is pretty intriguing, is perhaps the most horrible of all recorded magical spells. Cruelty, violence, sounds, headphones recommended. His, uh, all his descriptions are, are, are sort of like that. The description for Midnight Sword Fight also has periods between each word, except it's violence, sex, profanity, sausage. Mm. Well, this one is significantly darker than either of those two games, which I was not prepared for because I was you know, familiar with this other stuff. Well, looking up Tag Harem, apparently it's a type of Scottish oh, yeah. mode I, of divination. Actually, don't give it away. To... Don't give it away. Stop right now. <laughs> okay. If you don't know what Tag Harem is, don't Google it. Um, okay. So... 
Too late. Too late. <laughs> okay, so the Too game... Too late for me. I but know. you guys all can be spared. Well, so the game begins with you... So first off, this is a Twine game, unlike the other games where we've talked about of his, which are parser games. This is all Twine. And um, you are presumably a peasant, something like that, and you're waking up um, on the day that you're going to perform a Togharam. And it doesn't explain what that is. And uh, your wife or, or uh, you know... Uh, significant other seems cold to you in the morning and you you go down to a barn and the barn is stocked with wood enough for however long it's going to take and sacks also enough and what do the sacks have in them well you first have to light a fire and then you get out the first cat from the bag and you have to choose whether you're going to skewer the cat and then roast it alive over the fire or release it. And there are sound effects. Oh, there are sound effects to go along with all of this. And it's very distressing. So I played through the game twice to both what I assume are both of the two endings. There may be more I didn't discover. I don't think so, though. So the first ending, which... I don't feel like is a weird thing to give away is that, you know, you can skewer some of these cats, but if you start letting them go or let the fire go out, then your tog harem fails and a failed tog harem comes to nothing. And you and your well, cousin, there's nothing worse. Yeah. There's nothing worse than a failed, a failed tog harem. Everyone knows seems, that seems bad. And then once you reach the, <laughs> once you reach that ending, it gives you a quote, uh, from a book called an encyclopedia of fairies and i kind of don't want to read you the quote because it's from the end although really if you're a good person you'll play to this ending and let all the cats go and then you'll read this quote and then you'll be forced by how intriguing it is to start over and to skewer all the cats which took me almost a half an hour and Mm. You're basically, every single cat you drag out of the bag, it gives you a description of the cat. It's very brief. A tabby cat, a house cat, a cat with a collar, a lame cat, a cat with one eye. And with each one, you have to skewer it, hear the sound effect of that cat being roasted alive, and then put more wood on the fire to keep it from going out. And repeat that, and darker and darker creepy things happen uh, until the final conclusion. There is literally no game I've ever wanted to play less than this. <laughs> <laughs> I that know, was a very right? evil I, laugh right there, Reagan. Oh, I feel like you enjoyed the roasting. These oh guys. God, I so did. I am a dog person. A dog I did person. not enjoy this at all. But I did enjoy it. There were a lot of IF comp games about cats, and they were like, "You can have cats in books. You can have cats in Nick, and don't play Tag Herb if you don't. Like, if you actually <laughs> like cats." Yeah, don't. I didn't actually think about what that meant. It's didn't, dark. Thought maybe a cat got kicked. I didn't think cats were <laughs> skewered. Like it's a cat was hungry dark. and you held its food back for a half an hour or something. Yeah. Maybe you taunted a cat or a cat <laughs> scratched you. Didn't think you were skewering them and burning them so alive. So to kind of explain the tone of the game, the game that I would most compare this to is Year Walk. Um, it's a game about a strange folk practice being enacted in sort of game form. And I really... I really liked this, and that makes me sound like a psychopath, (laughs) but I thought this was really dark, haunting, and interesting. Great use of sort of making you do something that you don't want to do in a game for thematic effect, and I thought it was really cool. And so once again, I think Chandler Groover is, you know, pretty good at this. Yeah, I mean, when you put it that way, like, how many games do we play that consist entirely of us just like shooting and killing people? Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh yeah, that was great. I had a great time doing it. It's just whereas like- literally all this one does <laughs> is make you click on a link that says "do it." Like it's not <laughs> like you're you're seeing these things burn alive, although you do hear the yeah, ghastly sound say, effect. Slow torture of cats, not often explored in video games. <laughs> Kind of a niche subject matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty gross. And and there's a timer, so like you can't just click, 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 click to click a bunch of cats. You have to wait for them to burn, which is why it took so long. Anyway, it's dark, but it's very interesting. 
would make a good idle game if you could just sort of <laughs> check in on it and see how many cats had burned. Yeah, yeah. Cat clicker. <laughs> cat, oh god. Yeah. Oh cat my roaster. god. Oh god. Oh Jesus. I hope no one makes that. <laughs> so the next game up our list is uh, one that you played, Nate. Um, Spy Intrigue. Yeah. So this is the only one I uh, I've played for this uh, competition thus far, though I am intending to play many more. And as talked about. Uh, you know, several times when we cover this stuff, I am but a very much beginner in the interactive fiction world. Like, I pretty much never was into it until this podcast and talking to you guys, and I've enjoyed it ever since. But um, this is a game that I've spent at least an hour, upwards to an hour and a half playing, and it's and I've not finished it. So it's definitely a longer game with multiple, multiple endings. Uh, I believe it's considered a twine game um basically like wall of text or text with one to maybe three or four different things are highlighted that you can click to move forward you basically you play as a character uh who is it's his first day at a spy like college i guess or spy Spy academy spy thank you spy academy yeah absolutely and he arrives for his first day um and everyone is dead from mumps like mumps Spy mumps. <laughs> yeah. Mumps. So special mumps only for spies. It it makes anything that gets these spy mumps, uh, they basically swell up and explode. Oh, that's different from mumps. Yeah, it, and they make a big point of it, uh, including like equipment can get mumps, spy mumps, and blow up and explode. And and, and the like the truly unique thing about this game, the writing style is somewhere between like existential poetry and like blaze it 420 dank memes. <laughs> <laughs> like I like I don't know how to explain it better than that. So I did notice that the description was 100% all caps. <laughs> yeah, the whole game is 100% in all caps. And and so I, I just thought it it was best to just kind of I took some screenshots, screenshots of a couple different things, and I just wanted to read a few of them. It's pretty short. So uh, there's wait, a- wait, wait, wait. Can I just say that this guy? I clicked through to his Twitter profile, and his name on Twitter, uh, the his name as listed on the on the program is Ferkel, and his his handle is Ferkel underscore. But his Twitter display name is Macklemore of Twine. <laughs> I don't. I like. Part of me wants to hate it because it's like so obviously like like playing at that like. Everything's in caps and and like weed is funny and it's funny if I say fuck at every moment and it's funny if everything is just like over the top screaming, but it's balanced with this really like poetic language and and that's what makes it work. So like early on you run into uh like the your one of your main characters that you interact with is the secretary bot who might be kind of hot, um, but it's a robot. And you're questioning, like, it's the mumps. Come on. How did everyone die? And and they write back to you. says, they all went to an NHL game. One of the players gave them mumps, and then they all died. It flashes a picture on the screen in its robo chest of a series of NHL players smiling brightly in presumably unmumped days. <laughs> then another picture of a stern, haunted news anchor with a dissolved transition, like a super fucked up PowerPoint, but without the super fucked up word art. <laughs> and then the clickable link is just in all caps, oh fuck. <laughs> um, so this looks like the weird Twitter of Twine. It, it I, I really think it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> looking through this guy's writing and and his website, and I, I think that's a really apt uh <laughs> appropriate guess here but it's it's also it's really nice sometimes like he does a good job of like the moment so i'm going to read another one this is going to be a little bit longer but you're 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 locked tight in a rocket blasting towards your next um mission okay and things seem to be not going well at this moment uh it says You're going to die scared and alone, just like you always knew you would. Like the first animal in space. What was her name? L something? No, that's not right. Skywalker? That sounds more like it. 
more appropriate. The one the Soviet confed shot into space, and there was some terrible malfunction. They heard some awful grinding noise and some really sad dog noises, and then the spaceship just went all fucky and, ever, and never came back. Skywalker the dog, first dog in space. Wow. First animal lost in space. First animal dead in space. Given a hero's funeral and a moment of silence, observed the world over. And you, like her, drifting towards an unspecific certain doom. You wonder where, whether there might be more than one life and another one that starts right after this one ends. Maybe even multiple lives. An infinite, unbroken chain of lives. And you think about how nice it would be. And and so, like, it's... That's a different tone, and I like that. It is a very... But it's still, like, Skywalker the dog is obviously <laughs> yeah, a joke. Obviously not right. Leica. Yeah. yeah, it's not... Because <laughs> they obviously know, because they're like, L something? No, it's Skywalker. Um, <laughs> More and, appropriate. And, 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 like, the play of the game is basically the, the spy academy is like, well, hey, all the other spies are dead. Um, And we have to keep our corporate standing as one of the top 10 spy companies in the world. And so we need you to continue being a spy. Guess what? You're spy master. Here you go. We need you to do these missions. And you go out and you do missions. Um, You can die in many different ways. Uh, It's very, very easy for you to die. And, And the one last thing I want to talk about it with, and it's something that's it was very unique to me. You're playing as this narrative, it's you are this spy, but anytime you die, at least I died three times in my playthrough. I completed, uh, I was in the middle of my second mission, and again, i pretty far into this game, so a lot leading up to that middle of the second mission. Every time you die, it cuts to essentially an all-white screen, and you get kind of a shift in perspective to another character or maybe it's the same character but on a different timeline it's it's kind of hard to tell and it is a death scene of that person that is maybe somehow related to the action that you just had in the real game so to give you an example early on and i guess this is kind of spoilery but whatever you you get the option to choose different space like spy gear and if you click on selecting the gun it immediately jumps to this really really you know drop all of the you know dank memes all the 420 (laughs) blaze and stuff out of it and it's just this like first person perspective short story about someone who every day walks to it's either school or work, and they walk past the gun store, and then one day they finally go into the gun store, go home, open up a ton of cans of food for their cat, or it might be an it's an owl cat. The game is set in like a weird future. <laughs> sure, um, sure, why not? And it's not a gun. It's a more uh, cats. Yeah, it's not a gun. It's like a uh, it's like a disintegration device or like a reconfiguration device or something. But it's it's essentially a gun. And after opening up, opening up all the food in the house for the cat or owl cat, and locking itself in the locking themselves in the bathroom, they sit in a tub of warm water and eventually shoot themselves while hearing their cat crying on the other side of the door. And it's so sad, and like that stuff has really stuck with me. And then you go back and just like you hit back and you go back to whatever decision you made. And it's like, do you choose the banana bread with the USB port or the gun or like, (laughs) you know, like really silly things. And it's this balance. Like I don't, it it, like the, the, the silly stuff is so extreme that you don't want to like it, but it's balanced so well with everything else that I, I really have enjoyed it. That's Um, really cool. Yeah. I definitely recommend it. And, and give it some time because it starts pretty heavy on the on the goofy stuff. Um, but it's it's obviously very self aware. So yeah, I definitely recommend it. I really want to check that out. Um, next game up our list uh, was another one that I played. Uh, that's Grandma Bethlinda's Variety Box by Arthur DiBianca. Um, this was a game I went into pretty blind and. To be honest, I kind of picked it 
sort of at random. Um, and I'm really glad that I did. Well, it's it's a parser game. You're you know it's it's done in inform. It's uh, you're you know typing in commands, but it's a very minimalistic game. Probably more so than the one that you talked about earlier, Shane. It's it's a single room game. If you look around the room, there is literally nothing in it. it is it is a blank white void. You can't leave that room. And in the center of the room, there is a box. And that box, uh, if you try to mess with it it will eventually open up and reveal all sorts of interesting secrets. Um, but at first, it really just doesn't tell you anything. The game tells you, you know, that we have the game has very restrictive... It flashes a couple of simple instructions. One of them is, check the help. This game has very restrictive verbs. Yeah, I, I started this game, and that... It kind of reminded me of some of the other games I've really liked this year, which, which all have had a really short list of verbs. Yeah, I think that makes a, a game a lot more approachable. And w- one of the things that I... The game has a great sense of humor. It's very funny and, and quirky and interesting. It has a real personality. And you really immediately get that when it does describe for you the uh, the verbs that are available to you. It starts with, um, you know, while it's listing its commands, you can undertake to interact with things. Undertake to interact is the, uh, is the verb. Mercifully, it says, you can abbreviate this with just you. So almost everything that you're doing in the game, you are just doing you box, which would be undertake to interact with the box. Um, there's also things like, uh, you know, uh, look at, and it gives you some useful abbreviations, like the box eventually has a display and you can hit D to read the display at any time. So just really simple. You pretty much only have one type of command. It's like use. So, you know, there might be buttons and switches and everything. You don't press the button. You just interact with the button. So it's a bit difficult to explain um, why it's so cute, but I'll kind of, but the easiest game to compare it to would be like, did you guys play The Room um, or any of its sequels? Do you remember those games mm-hmm. for the iOS? iOS games? Yeah, yeah. Sure. And it's a single room game. You've got basically a puzzle box in front of you and you've got to open and explore the puzzle box and um, you've got to like investigate tiny details on the puzzle box. This is that, but done in a parser. Um, but the puzzle box sort of has a personality and a sense of humor. So the puzzle box will give you instructions on its screen. Um, Sometimes its instructions are wrong. Sometimes its instructions are jokes. Um, And sometimes the things that you have to do with its parts are kind of bizarre. I had to check the walkthrough a couple of times. It comes conveniently with one. So I, I wouldn't say like, Definitely go straight to the walkthrough. Avoid it if you can. Um, but there were a couple places I was playing this for the show, and I really wanted to get to the end where it. Um, uh, it, it I, I did go to the walkthrough and check it out. I'd say that it, it it held my attention the whole time. It was about maybe 30, 40 minutes of play. Um, once I got to the end, it really had been building up. What's inside this box that has these crazy buttons and ropes and switches and whistles and a weird little display? Brad Pitt's wife's and, head. And no, it, um, and, and the 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 uh, the end was a little bit bizarrely disappointing. Although I don't know what I was expecting to be inside the box, um, <laughs> but actually, it does something very clever at the end, which is once you've opened the box and solved all of the secrets of all of the widgets and whistles and knobs and pulleys and flags and whatnot that are on the box. Um, it gives you the option to view the credits, and then afterwards, you can continue to interact with the box, and everything that was on on and attached to the box now does something slightly different, which I thought was a really clever way to kind of, like, you know, ease you out of the game. It's a really cute, really pleasant little puzzle experience. I did not like The Room. I do not like that style of game where you're, you know, investigating a puzzle box. I really liked this one, so... If that's intriguing to you, give it a shot. It's very cute and, and uh, has a lot of personality. Sounds great. The next game on our list was another one Laura played, Ether, by Mathbrush. Good name. Yes, by Mathbrush. And um, Ether was an odd game for me to play because I have absurdly bad spatial reasoning skills. Um, and Ether is a game where you play a floating cephalopod who moves in three dimensions. So you move like northwest down Ooh. um you can move in directions singly but you are also moving in three directions and that affects the wind the atmospheric pressure the temperature um where you are in space is very um it, it definitely applies a context to things like your inventory uh, where you are in location to objects 
but it makes it a lot easier on you than you would think because you don't have to track exactly where on the grid. And I never had to take notes. There are objects that you're going to intersect with in this game. Um, you start off with a um, kind of a glowing red light that you're heading towards. And you can just say, go to light. Huh. And it will move you in the appropriate direction. Um, another thing that makes it a lot easier is you can type quant on. And it'll apply numbers to each scale. So, you know, we'll say you are at, you know, pressure seven. And it's from a zero to eight scale. And you know if you go above eight that you're going to die. Hmm. Um, so you can actually put numbers on if you're not sure if you have reached the right um, condition for something. For example, you get this red eye light, it holds your magic and you need to melt the ice around it. So you need to go down to heat. So there's a certain direction you can go to warm up the temperature. Um, and in addition to this really creative use of space and three dimensions, the game is actually really short um you are creating you know collecting things creating a new world um and kind of putting pieces together um it's lovely to just kind of embody an abstract concept i guess huh. <laughs> you're more like this thing moving through space um it doesn't worry too much about um emotions although they do pull it in at the end but it is a really lovely light puzzle game. Hmm. Um, and you're playing, you know, a kind of a, it says cephalopod. I guess you're a, you know, was it a shell, a nautilus? Um, sure. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, that doesn't really matter that much, except you have, you know, kind of tentacles and you, or, you know, you're, you're grabbing things. Parser is really clever because in addition to those two things that make it easier that I mentioned for the spatial reasoning, you also always know you can pick up something because it will say you are right next to the object and then you can take it. Mm, um, nice. Yeah. And you automatically carry things with you. It knows that it's already complicated the world, so it doesn't bother to complicate the inventory or the navigation, which I really appreciated um, it feels like they really wanted to explore one element and created a game where they simplified everything else as much as humanly possible. You know, I think that's kind of the trend in, in IF right now. I, I, I remember that like oh, when I was first starting to get into it, the navigation on a lot of the games was still really inspired by the original IF stuff mm -hmm. from the 80s and by kind of RPG stuff where it I and the you know where they expected you to be mapping things out on graph paper you know to the, the, the is that level of complexity and when I was getting into it some of the stuff that was really experimental and cool was like oh what we're gonna do is make it so much simpler by mapping it out on graph paper for you creating a <laughs> visual map or something Fun. Uh, but today I think people are are realizing you just don't have to have that kind of thing in your game for navigation to matter. Yeah, Ether is way too delicate and too it has too much of a light touch for its puzzles for a really sophisticated system of navigation to be a requirement. It doesn't require so much labor or, you know, skullduggery to work, which I, I really appreciated. I don't think it was the most memorable game I played, but I the mechanic was very well done. Well, the next game up on our list was one that I really, really liked. And this is the last of the ones that I played uh, for this episode this week. Um, and that was Duel by Piatto, I think is the way that's supposed to be pronounced. This one, oddly enough, may have been my favorite of the ones we talked about today or the ones I played for, for this week. Um, it's a, uh, first off, uh, Duel is a twine game. And it's it's very clearly like porpentine school of twine games, but it does some interesting things. Or it does, does something that I, I haven't seen as a big aspect in her work. First of all, I'd kind of describe it as like like a dark, creepy Pokemon battle. <laughs> um, it's a game where you're 
having a duel with a nameless opponent. You have to skewer Pokemon and put them onto a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Good callback. No. Nice, nice callback. <laughs> um, so you're you're participating in a duel in what seems to be a sort of a dark fantasy world, and the setup for the duel as you prepare is that you are standing next to some sort of obelisk, and your apartment uh, your partner. In the duel, your opponent is standing across from you, across this field for the duel, and he's also standing next to some sort of post. And you have to lash yourself tightly to the post with... Um, with with thin black uh, rope. So actually, there's a there's a quote from the uh, from the initial intro, which says the rope is thin, black, thoroughly practical. Your hands wind through practiced motions, lash- lashing yourself fast to the stake behind. No one who is worthy would hesitate. And it really only takes about 15 minutes to play, but you'll probably need to restart it several times in order to win the duel because it's got some it's a, it's a pretty interesting little sort of puzzle in and of itself. So the duel takes place in the space between you with you both lashed to these posts. And once you're all lashed up, you see basically a list of choices um, that you can choose at any point. So, And you're taking turns with your opponent. So you have a memory of absolute leadership. You have a memory of mastery, painfully won. You have a memory of power and terror. You have a memory of perfect desolation. You have a memory of madness, artfully cultivated. Or perhaps you could do nothing at all. And those are your options in each round. And each of those memories, if you select it, will describe a creepy person or being that you remember from your life in this dark fantasy world. And it really reminded me a lot of some of Porpentine's work. So it's clear they're really either working in the same vein. That's not to say that it's derivative. I think it's really like it's its own thing. But um, I mean, that's the easiest way to describe the vibe here. Um, if you're at all familiar with her stuff. And if you aren't, go listen to our episode on her collected works. She's great. Anyway, um, you pick one of these memories and summon it into being. And then that, that creature from your memory is there, then there on the play field. And your opponent then summons one of his own and they do battle in some way. And the only way to win is essentially to summon your list of memories in an order that will defeat his. He always releases his in the same order. So once you get a sense of what all of yours are and what all of his are, um, you can work out how to defeat him. And the best hint I would give without going into detail would be um, you have to do a lot of waiting right at the start. Even though you get to play first, you want to wait for him to go first. Um, Really, really interesting. A walkthrough is provided. Um, I played through the game probably six or eight times, and I got quite close to the right solution. But I, and I really, I think I probably would have gotten it if I'd kept at it a little longer. But since I was playing for the show, I really just wanted to get to the solution. So I skimmed over the, uh, over the walkthrough, which was pretty well done as well. And, uh, and it was really cool. I, I think this is a really nicely done, short, interesting twine game. I give it an A+. It's awesome. It's more it's more game than a lot of these actually are because like there there's a lot of thinking about how your weird creepy shit is going to interact with the other guy's weird creepy shit and um like thinking about like one of your one of your uh, things summons a a flood that washes away other things on the field. Um but other things that you have are like um a couple of them are one is a uh, when you remember one of them it's this woman who it describes her in prison meditating and finally flaying off all of her own skin, which gives her some sort of dark power to overcome the people that uh, that uh, that imprisoned her. And she walks out, mm-hmm. you know, all full of madness. And yeah. that's like the kind of that's the kind of Pokemon you're you're you know I choose you, creepy woman with no skin. Like that's that's the kind of shit you're summoning here, and it's really interesting. Oh man, flayed skin. That is. I know there's no one out there who's like. Yes, that sounds great to me. But. I'm way into flay skin. <laughs> yeah, Franken, you played much darker games than I did this week. Oh yeah, yeah, sure yeah. did. But I also played Grandma Beth Linda, so you know that's true. So the last game on our list this week was another one that you played, Laura. Right, uh, a figure met in a shaded wood by Michael. Yeah, I, actually, I, I played two more, but they're both under five minutes. Oh, okay. 
but designed to be played a few times. Wow. Um, on the lighthearted end of the spectrum, The King and the Crown um, is a game about your king who basically all the dragons have been slayed and all you have to do is put your crown on, find your scepter, and sit on your throne. Um, but the game is designed so that if you type in, you know, they tell you to type in help and they say, are you a completionist? If you type in yes, they're like, oh, there's five hidden secrets. So in the five minute game, if you like, you can keep typing, keep trying things. Um, the epilogue always gives you hints to find the secrets. So even with finding all the secrets, it's maybe 10 minutes tops. What if you there say no? There are fart jokes. If you say no, they're like, okay, cool. The game will take five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, lightly humorous. Um, as I said, there are fart jokes. Um, <laughs> it's very light. Um, kind of a good palate cleanser if you've just been dealing with flayed people. Oh, yeah. Um, oh wait, well, actually one more uh, that I forgot I mentioned that I did that I did for did that I played. Uh speaking of light, um I also <laughs> I also played another cat game. This one's oh. very different <laughs> called Forever Meow. Um, oh. uh, How would you forget for you Forever <laughs> Meow? Uh well, I, well because frankly it didn't make that much of an impression. It's um oh. it's a pretty good game. You play as a kitty cat. It's a twine style web based uh game where you, you know, you're choosing choices for the kitty cat and the cat has options like jump on top of the table and and knock things off of the table and so on but as you uh, as you do all of your little kitty cat stuff it becomes obvious that you're on a spaceship and then the kitty cat gets to save the day that's the <laughs> that's the story Aww. um I, like toby's nose but with a cat yeah in space. kind of I, I i thought this was pretty light very cute if you like cats maybe play this one instead of tech <laughs> and you'll probably like it better than i did because apparently that's that's my dark secret is i hate cats with a burning passion and want to see them f fried but um this game didn't really mm. do it for me i can't see a whole lot of uh, of overlap between the people who would like tag heron and forever meow so maybe give that a shot if you really like cats instead of liking to murder them sorry go ahead laura i interrupted you <laughs> Oh, no, I was just going to say my last one was a figure met in a shaded wood. And I played this because um, Lee Alexander put out a tweet that said, hey, I just played an IF comp game that had a scarily accurate tarot reading. And I was like, oh, tarot reading. I'm in. Ooh. Didn't realize that was a joke. Um, so you're a vagabond. You walk along. You meet a person. You can choose to get your fortune read. And um, you should play this game more than once. I'm trying to be intentionally vague because the game also is, you know, you, you'll play it multiple times. It's very short. And I worry about giving away why this game is going to frustrate the hell out of some people. And some people are going to love it. Because if you play this game once, you didn't play the game. Hmm. You must play at least twice. Okay. And click the link that says, but... On the second playthrough, like B U T T or <laughs> no B U T. <laughs> okay. Like this is not a king's crown. Like there's it, no fart jokes. Because if it's the link that says but, like B U T T, you know no, I'm clicking like, it. No, it's like but. <laughs> well, that yep. sounds really intriguing, and uh, I actually sometimes really prefer these incredibly short. When it comes to this sort of field of games, I sometimes really prefer these very very short games that have a really neat concept that you don't want to explain for fear of spoiling the short gem of an experience. So I think we'll leave it at that with a figure met in a shaded wood. Going into it, that's how I felt with like spy intrigue. I was like, oh, cool. I'll play a quick spy game. And then like an hour and 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh, my God. I I, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how many missions on left I have to do. Like, like I, I really, really enjoyed it. But it was a deeper dive than I was expecting, knowing how most of these games I would say that, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, that's not the norm. Like, it seems to me most games are an hour or less. Well, Twine games, yeah. I'd say that the parser games often tend to be a little longer or, well, depends on your skill at puzzle solving and the style of games. But, yeah, a lot of Twine games are pretty short. I would love it if I have comp and or spring thing, when they get to this, you know, when they get to a really large size, um, it would start doing a light tagging system like Porpentine had in um, uh, the collection we played. Mm -hmm. Eczema um, Angel Orifice, yeah. Eczema Angel Orifice. You could pick, do you want a serious, light, puzzle, um, short, long, you know, just major categories. So you could say, I want a short game because mm -hmm. I have 
you know, 15 minutes on my lunch break, they'll be like, play a figure man in a shade of wood. Yeah, that would be a really nice addition to the site. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe the uh, the writers could tag their own games. Exactly. The if the writers tags, tag their yeah. own games. Yeah. I wonder be- if that's against the point of the competition, though, right? Like, I think part of it is that, like, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. And it's just like, all you have is the title of it. And the title says a lot about games, but it it only says so much. So, you know, in my, uh, you know, naive understanding of it, it seems to me like part of it, it would be spoiled a little bit if I clicked on a game and I knew it would only be 10 minutes. Yeah, in some cases, I think you're right. Um, sometimes, sometimes games can also have really wildly variable lengths. I've seen games where you can easily die in the first 10 minutes and think it's all done with. Tag Heron, for example, um, my first playthrough uh, was five minutes and my last was, I think, 45 or maybe maybe just a half an hour. But it was pretty long burning all them cats. So um, you just wanted to stay in that world forever. I did. I wanted to savor <laughs> it. <laughs> Never wanted to leave. Good God. <laughs> So yeah, like I think it would be it'd be a complex thing to to really do, but it would be nice, I guess. Um, so if you learned anything this week, it's um, IF Comp is great. Reagan is a psychopath who likes burning cats, and you guys should all play at least five games and be judges in IF Comp this year. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, the the con- the contest is going to continue for you've still got time when this game when this episode comes out, you'll still have close to two weeks, maybe a little longer, to uh, to participate in the interactive fiction competition. This is probably our last episode on IF Comp 2015 before the conclusion of the contest, which is going to be November 15th, at which point all of the uh, all of the scores are tallied and you'll see winners. But we'll definitely return either on another episode or maybe do a, a kind of a recap episode to tell you what wins, uh, what comes out ahead, what wins the Golden Banana of Discord Award for the highest standard deviation of score, what wins wins the uh, Miss Congeniality Award, voted on, only by authors of other games in the contest. So I'm really interested to um, to see what the results are this year, and maybe to see if I missed anything cool that I haven't had time to play yet. I know that, um, I mean, even with all of us, we've maybe gotten to a third of the games in the contest this year. So Yeah, I'll say that probably the two games that I started but haven't played enough to feel like I could review it here. Birdland and Cape might be the best ones I've played so far. Wow. So I definitely uh, want to check those out. I think Birdland in particular looked really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. So apart from playing a lot of cool text games, um, we've got just a couple minutes to wrap up. What have you guys been up to this week? <laughs> oh, God. I hear that. I think we've all been playing down well. Such an Incredible arcade game. It really is. Um, it's probably the best arcade style game I played on my iPhone in a long time. So yeah, thanks Laura for recommending it. Yeah, I just recently upgraded to the iPhone uh, 6s, giving me that bigger screen and compared to my previous 5s. And um, this has been a really good kind of showcase of that. I know it's not graphically intensive, but like I definitely feel that. I'm enjoying this game much more that I now that I have more space on it. Yeah, it rocks on the 6S+. Plus. I really like the the style of controls that it has. Um, what's kind of neat about it is that most iPhone games that are action-oriented in any way are you're going to hold your phone horizontally. But in this one, you're holding the phone vertically kind of like it, it feels like kind of like a Game Boy um, with your controls at the very bottom. So on the larger screen phones, that feels really neat. And it works really well with the sort of layout of the game, which is that you're falling through a tunnel or, or well. And so your, you know, your phone screen being vertical gives you a kind of a good uh, palette for that. Really neat game. Yeah. I will say the game is hot garbage if you play on anything with an old chip. Oh, I played yeah. on my iPad Mini 1 and it is slow and you do not understand how good this game is until you play on a machine that can be as speedy as this game is because the engine is fast and quick and, you know, spur of the moment. And if you play on an older device, you're playing like in slow-mo yeah my one complaint about the game i think is probably related is that it's a inordinately huge battery hog oh it oh yeah yeah battery i I think and and what's kind of weird about it is that like even on i'm running this on a 6s plus so the fanciest phone on the market at the moment in terms of the like performance humble brag humble brag brag. and uh 
if you get to the end of a level and there's a lot of little objects bouncing around, um, it still gets slow. Well, and and to kind of piggyback off of um, your previous point that like it controls really well, it's one of the first games that I've had that I would say has been um, fast that has felt natural on an iPhone. Yeah, and particularly probably, considering it has a virtual D-pad or, well, kind of left exact, and right pad. And, yeah, exactly. I would say, like, the other kind of fast game would be uh, You Must Build a Boat, but that was, like, a different kind of fast. Yeah. Um, this is, you know, left and right arrows on the screen and a jump button on the screen, mm-hmm. and normally I avoid that because I don't feel like it's it had been done very well, but... Uh, so yeah, they nailed great. it here. Yeah, yeah. If, if for some reason that doesn't work for you, it's also available on Steam, and you can play it with a controller. Um, I think that the iPhone version is probably the definitive version, but um, you can also do that if you want. Cool game. I don't know. The longest I've made it has been like three minutes. You know, so like, yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet. I, I still haven't I, gotten to the second like world or whatever you call the those. catacombs. Yeah. It's a great game, but it is like a game that is almost so sporadic that you need to play it for like five minutes and then be like, okay, I'm, I'm not looking at this. Yeah. That's kind of why I like it on the iPhone. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine sitting in front of a computer to play this game because I think I would still just end up shutting it down after five minutes, but that's not a knock on the game. It's great, (laughs) but it's like, it's, it's like an arcade game, like you yeah. were saying. Like I, you can't spend an extreme amount of time with it, unless you're on a plane, in which case you can play it for an hour straight. Well, and... plane time is different time. At which point, like, are you? Is it shiny dots on the screen? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna stare at it for like 45 minutes because I'm on a plane and I literally have nothing else to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, that my first time playing this was also on a plane. I think we've all. We've all been on planes recently playing Downwell. Same here. Mm-hmm. Wild. I yeah. played, uh, <laughs> I played, um, this is kind of far back to a previous episode, but I played the um, Zelda game for the DS that we, A Link Between Worlds, and it kept saying, like, hey, you've been playing for a while. Why don't you put this down? And, which I get it, it's like a Nintendo thing, but I wish that there was a button that said, no, but I'm on a plane. <laughs> you don't understand. Yeah. There's absolutely... I cannot take a yeah. walk. And this is the healthiest thing I can... It's like, this is the most movement I can do right now. I can't this move is the legs. only thing staving off thrombosis. Yeah. And, I, and like if you say I'm on a plane, they'd be like, all right, you're cool. I'll stop bugging you. Because yeah, totally. it's like every time you save, they're like, no, you've been playing a while. Why don't you chill? I'm like, yeah. I would love to do something else. That console has a <laughs> has a like pedometer in it. It's like you haven't moved in four hours. What's wrong with you? Yeah. So, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Short Game. Um, uh, you can find all the show notes and information about our show, as well as links to every game and everything else we've discussed. Uh, on our website at www.theshortgame.net. You can also write to us with feedback. If we missed your favorite game on IF Comp, or if you just want to let us know that you are answering the call and playing some games and voting in IF Comp this year, um, write to us at info at theshortgame.net, or you can find our show on Twitter at underscore shortgame. Uh, I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R A Y G A N K. Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Nate, where can people find you? Also on Twitter at Nate STL. And last but not least, Shane, where can people find you? I can be found on Twitter at 8BitShane. And thank you so much once again for joining us on another episode of The Short Game.